Okay, so we apparently don't have a moderator, <laughs> or at least one was not identified to us before. So uh, I'll go ahead and start. My name's TJ Myhill. I'm an attorney here in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I, I practice mostly civil law, so we don't deal with law enforcement use of social media as much in my current practice, but we sure use it. We use it all the time, and for many of the same reasons, so we certainly would, uh, would have the insights into the, the legal use uh, of your of your information, your public information, and, and the officer's use of data mined information. That's what we're going to be covering today. Uh, we have a full panel of guests, none of whom I know, so I'll ask them to introduce themselves. <laughs> Randall? Hi, I'm Randall Schwartz, uh, probably best known for, is this on? Probably best known for uh, my work on Pearl, the uh, famous camel, alpaca, uh, and llama books. Those are all mine. But uh, some of you may actually know me from my podcast, Floss Weekly, which I've been doing for 10 years, I'm having a great time doing that. Uh, so uh, I think I'm on this panel because I'm a social media butterfly. Um, <laughs> as in, uh, for example, I check in on Swarm everywhere I go, constantly. And when you check in, you get points, meaningless points, of course. But the meaningless points can be, is it working? OK, well, now it is. Okay. The, uh, the meaning is points. I, people ask me, what are the points for? And I go, well, it's to buy stickers. And I go, well, what's the stickers for? Well, it gives you multipliers. So what are the multipliers for? Well, that means when you check in, you get more points. <laughs> so it's a, it's a completely circular <laughs> loop, but, uh, but I do it all the time. And so uh, I'm here to, as an interested person about social media and, and how it relates to law enforcement. Uh, my name is Jenny Gebhardt. Uh, I'm a researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco, <coughs> where I specialize in consumer privacy and security. Um, and I think I predict I will mostly defer to our lawyers on this panel. Um, but I will be especially interested to hear your questions about kind of how to protect yourself on social media, um, how we approach social media when we assume indeed that social media is not optional. We can't just tell you like, oh, maybe you should just stop doing that. Um, so I'll answer kind of more of your user side questions. Um, and my name is Amy Stepanovich, and I am told I am the moderator, so I... <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a moderator! Now Proud to awesome. step into that role. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> Not a problem. It wasn't on the website. Um, I am U.S. Policy Manager and Global Policy Council at Access Now, which is a global human rights organization working on the intersection of human rights and technology. Um, and so we come at these issues from big surprise, a human rights perspective. And from that perspective, actually, we have this radical notion that your data belongs to you. Um, and that whilst public data might be public, when people collect public data en masse, like they're doing today using algorithms, using machine learning, um, and learning private information from your public information, that law enforcement actually should have to go through some sort of process like they normally have to do to get your private information. Um, so we fight really hard to protect that private information um, and for around the world. Unfortunately, right now, we're losing a lot of that battle because so much information is public, um, quote unquote public. And so with the creation of these algorithms to feed mass amounts of information in, uh, more and more of your information is being sucked up under this public information um, exception to rule, typical rules for law enforcement. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is figure out how to combat that and how to come back down to um, kind of the, the normal average state of things where your private information is still um, private and requires some sort of process. Um, clearly, I did not know I was the moderator. <laughs> so um, having that brief introduction from everybody, um, why don't we go down the line real quick and talk about, I think in 2009 there was a big... Um, reveal that social media information was going to be regularly collected by law enforcement um, and by DHS. Um, what was interesting is when the San Bernardino terrorist attack happened, that all came back into the news again. Um, and all of a sudden it was really controversial about whether or not law enforcement was going to collect information it was already collecting or why it wasn't collecting that information. Um, in addition to that, there was a big controversy around whether or not um, law enforcement should be able to, because they currently think they are able to, um, pose an alternate. Yes, sorry. 
No, yeah, yeah. sorry about that. Um, actually, what's funny is when I'm not talking to the mic, it sounds like to me like I'm talking into the mic, and then I talk into the mic, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what the mic sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's totally my fault. Um, so... After the San Bernardino terrorist attacks, we were discussing whether or not law enforcement should be collecting public social media information. Um, it turned out that they were already doing that, um, and they had massive programs to do that, both at the state um, and local level as well as at the federal level through DHS. Um, unfortunately, what was really controversial was whether or not and to what extent people could pose as other people to incentivize you to friend them to gain access to non-public content. Um, law enforcement was already doing that. It's typical practice um, for them to be able to create quote unquote fake profiles that you could friend. Um, DHS at the time had rules against it and said that you could not actually do that and they had a pretty big push to try to get past those rules. So I guess working on three levels, to what extent do you believe um, law enforcement and government should have access to your public information? To what extent should they um, have access to the private information, your public information details, and to what extent should they be able to pose as somebody else to gain access to the private information that you have chosen voluntarily to restrict the audience to, um, which are the three, I think, big policy points to make here. So reverse order from how we started. Um, Ginny, Randall, TJ. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> All right. Those are some big questions. Um, okay, so to recap, should they have access to information that you've made public? Should they be able to figure out from that public information things that are private? Should they be able to use algorithms yeah. against that information? And should they be able to get access to your private information you wouldn't ordinarily give them access to? I will work backwards. Uh, three, should they have access to your private information you've made private? No. Um, two, should they be able to use, you know, advanced methods to put together the pieces of all the constellation of things you've made public to intuit or assume things that you haven't made private? Um, I guess, to me, it's less should they have access to that or be able to intuit that. To me, it's more should you be able to appeal and say, hey, you have assumed from, you know, data point A, B, and C on page 50 of my Google results that I am this or that I do this. You should be able to correct that if it's not right. Um, and then for the first one, should they have access to things you made public? Um, it's hard for me as kind of someone on the technology side because my immediate reaction, I kind of run into all my, should they? Well, they do. You put it on the internet. Um, and I think so often to me, and again, this is coming from where I come from in consumer privacy, um, often the things that we put online and we make public, we don't mean to. Um, on the profiles we use, on social media, on the various platforms that we trust, there are a lot of really tricky defaults or defaults that change after the fact that make things public that we didn't know were public. Um, I've sat down with people to Google themselves and they're shocked by what's on there. And they are, in fact, the per person who pressed publish to put it online. This happens all the time with Facebook. This happens with Twitter. Um, these privacy policies change all the time. And they can have effects, or they can change defaults without you being really explicitly aware. Um, so I think, you know, for me, whether they should have that access or not, I think that you should have more control and more transparency into precisely how the things that you put online are published. Because often it's not clear that they're going to be indeed publicly available um, when you think they aren't. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. So Randall, how do you feel as a prolific social media user? <laughs> well, you know, you said it so well already, but I, I want to bring out a couple more points. One is that um, we don't know the extent to which law enforcement is accessing backside data, hmm. getting access to, uh, you know, my, my private messages, things like that. Uh, I, I think I'm willing to be responsible for everything I publish in public. I think I have to own that because that's me pushing that button over and over and over again. I think one of the things that uh, is troubling these days is the oversharing of yep, the kids. I think they share way more than they understand what the impact of that is. And uh, but I, I'm an old kid apparently because I share everything all the time on my on, online. Uh, but so so yeah. I mean, I remember being troubled a number of years ago by finding out, I think it was some three-letter organization that actually owns a stake in Facebook. Okay. There's some organization, FBI, CIA, one of those, right? Something, right. Anyway, so I was like, wait, how is, how is this good? 
little scared by that. I'll stop there. Well, I, I will echo the last two statements about about being aware of your own public postings, public uh, image. It, it really feels like I come here every year, and I don't even want to be reminded how many years <laughs> I've been doing EFF panels. <laughs> yep. But I, it feels like I've come here every year, and every year, at at least one of these panels, I'm saying, be responsible for what you put online and stop putting so much shit online. But we still do, and I still have to say it every year. So here we are. I'm going to say it. Stop putting so much shit online. We really do. We really do amazingly overshare, often without our knowledge, because we didn't read the EULA, and we have no idea what the terms of service say as far as the privacy settings. And we didn't set the privacy settings anyway. So we just go out there. We have no idea who actually has access to our stuff. But even when we do, it's amazing what people share. And certainly the younger generation is sharing, I think, more than – than, than, than older people, but we are all guilty of it. And the, the, the reason why that's critical is let's talk about some of the ways, before I answer the question, let's talk about some of the ways that, that law enforcement does use social media so we can see how each of those questions applies to sort of the two different avenues. The first avenue is you individually providing evidence against yourself through your social media. This is where, for example, I already suspect you of a crime, or you're already a defendant or a plaintiff in one of my lawsuits. And I want to find out more about you. And so I go Google you, or I pull up your Facebook profile or your Instagram feed. And it's amazing how many people will admit to crimes on social media. I mean, it, it, it happens all the time. And then there's the second layer over that where um, I know you committed the crime or I'm trying to sue you, and I need to serve you, but you're hiding from me. Hmm. But you've posted on Facebook that you're going to be at your aunt's birthday party. Well, guess who else is going to be at your aunt's birthday party? The sheriff with some paperwork for you. So, you know, these are the ways that, that they use your public data to, to find out, you know, what exactly you're doing and what you're, putting, what you're putting online about you in an individual search. And that, frankly, I have no problem with. Because I think that if you're going to post online that you committed a crime, when I suspect you of a crime, and I'm looking at your Facebook profile and it says, yes, I did it, well, then, <laughs> dummy, of course I'm going to use that information. So I have no problem with that use. The flip side, though, is what we were talking about at the start of this, which is sort of the data monitoring or data mining, where people are, are searching the entirety of a social media source with keywords or, or with, other, with other data mining technologies and looking for investigative materials. Not, not, I suspect that Randall stole my car and now there's a picture on Facebook of Randall driving what really looks like my car. <laughs> I want to do search for car theft or some other you know, type of, of, of broad topic and we're just filtering through social media uh, materials to get that information. That, that's, the, that's the aggregator or mining aspect that is really the concern. And should you do it? Again, for public data, I don't think there's a problem with it because it's public data. Should it be public data? Well, check your settings. If it's not public data, if I have to go try to be your friend to sneak past you, to, to, to trick you into sharing public data with me, well, that's a little different because I don't really think that we ought to be getting into that type of, of, of relationship. At the same time, it's not really any different than the undercover officer showing up at your house and trying to be your friend and hoping you'll invite him into your crime. Um, it's, it's part of the investigation. So again, I want to be your friend is a little different than I want to just search through the data on your on your profile or your feed or your various feeds and aggregate it together. So I think there's a, a bit of a difference on that as well. And, and I do think there ought to be some process to get into the data because there already is. If I want your data, I can subpoena it. I can subpoena certain information from your, from your, your, your various social media providers. What I get varies greatly and, and what they're, they're going to share with me varies greatly. 
but there's a process in place, but I follow the steps. I ask the court permission to get it. I go get a subpoena, and the court gives me a subpoena if it thinks I should get one, and I go get that information through a, a process of law. I do think that we ought to have some process by which we have to govern that type of information gathering about back-end back -end data, because I believe that's very different. One of the things that concerns me about what you just said, though, is how is that not entrapment when somebody pretends to be one of my friends? They're committing fraud and saying they're one of my the people I know. How is that not entrapment? Well, I mean, the, 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 here's where my criminal law buddy <laughs> okay. would say, of course it is. <laughs> Okay. And, and he would argue that, and, and, and frankly, I don't really, again, I'm, I do more civil, I don't know the, 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 the meets and bounds of entrapment, but I do know, obviously, that we can take certain investigative measures. I can, I can go pretend to infiltrate your criminal enterprise, and if you let me in, then I'm in, and, you know, okay. choose your friends wisely. So I want to add um, two wrenches to the conversation um, and challenge you on a couple of points, all three of you. Um, and then we're going to open it up to questions. So I want all of you thinking of really, really great, <laughs> succinct 30 to 45 second questions that end with your voice going up as if there is a question mark at the end of your statement yeah. and is not very long statement with a period. What do you think about that? <laughs> um, so the first one I want to throw in is the idea that, um, TJ, you said that you're you're kind of okay with law enforcement friending people so long at because it, it looks like traditional undercover operations right. um however on facebook there's this very interesting thing where um a lot of times i not only gain access to the data of the people i'm friending i gain additional access to all of their friends data um and potentially even a, a step out from that and all of their friends yeah, friends kind of data um so in a world where you do not actually know all of the people your friends are friends with, does that actually look maybe a little more intrusive than traditional undercover operations? And real quick, let me throw the second one in so I can open it up to everybody. Um, there's a really important question of context here. And one of my favorite social media monitoring stories, and I use the term favorite loosely here because I think this is vaguely horrifying, um, is these, these people were visiting the United States um, and they had tweeted at some point, we're gonna blow New York up. And they got detained at the airport. The really sad thing is they were saying, we're gonna go party in New York. <laughs> yeah. They were not saying they actually want you to, to take a bomb into the city of New York and blow it up. Um, but without context, it's really hard to tell sometimes. And I'm guessing everybody in this audience and everybody on this panel has at some point put something on social media that you're like, well, I'm really glad that nobody is seeing this out of context. Um, although they are in many instances. Um, and to what extent does context play? And I know for, you know, Scott, I think for future um, EFA, EFA forums, I think having um, a session on kids and privacy would be fascinating because yeah. on every panel I've been on, there's been yeah. the question of kids oversharing. And I actually think a lot of the research proves the opposite, is that kids are actually more conscious of their privacy um, than their older counterparts. Mm. Um, and that they are very contextual with what they share. Um, and it is the context plays a much bigger role. Um, so to what, to what extent does context fit into the social media monitoring conversation for people of all ages? Um, my 13-year-old niece, who I have found is the most sophisticated sharer of information I have ever met in my life, um, all the way through to my 91-year-old grandmother um, who doesn't really understand what Facebook is. I can jump in really fast. Um, just, and I'm sure a lot of you have the same intuition or the same thought. Um, Amy, when you talk about context, for me, one of the, again, not a lawyer, um, but as a technologist, a consumer advocate, um, one of the biggest things I think of for context is users do not desire or generally expect law enforcement to be viewing the things they're posting, whether they're private or public or closed or whatever the settings may be. Um, that is so key to me when, when we talk about ways to protect users, um, ways to perhaps raise awareness among users. People generally do not desire or expect this. Um, and then second, as far as, you know, our, the kids are oversharing or gen the general sentiment of just, you know, stop posting so much shit online. Um, I know for a lot of people that's simply not an option. Um, if your profession, if your community requires public sharing and engagement, um, 
is, it may be good advice, but you're not going to follow it. Um, and honestly, I think you shouldn't have to. We should have a space where you can feel safe, again, in many different contexts, sharing to some extent. Um, not to take responsibility off the user, but to kind of put some more responsibility on the creators of these environments, which tend to be private companies with no mandate um, to serve us equitably. Um, and I know, I think this is a great crowd for this. I mean, we have authors who need exposure. They cannot just preach to the choir of people they know. Um, we have people who kind of, you find community and you find joy online, not with people who are in your physical space. And that's the only place to reach out, to find new communities, to communicate. Um, not using that is just not an option. Um, I don't have an answer. If I did, we could all go home. Um, but I think so often when we run to that advice, to me, that's my sign of like, okay, we can do better. If our best advice is stop sharing that, stop doing that on social media, then that's my cue to do better. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to deal with the wrenches. Well, let me, let me, let me respond to that last point because I think, it, I think it is critical. There are people who have things that need to be on social media or, or, or people who must market on social media to make their, their job effective or sell their book. But the things that you're putting on to sell your book aren't things that law enforcement is going to come knocking at your door about. So just real quick, guys, I think we need to talk with like this much space yeah, I know, between we really our are. mouths really and the are. microphones. Okay, so yeah. the the you know the when I say stop sharing so much shit online, it's because I'm coming into panels where we're talking about you know law enforcement use of it, or you know we did the revenge porn panels several times over the years. There's a lot of stuff that we need to be very, very careful what we're sharing and very, very aware of what we're sharing. And, and frankly, if we're sharing things that, that admit to engaging in illegal behavior, that's not something you have to do to, to, to make your job effective. That's not something you have to do to sell your book. That's something you're being dumb. So don't be dumb. But as far as whether or not we ought to have whole different discussions about the privacy limits on the companies who we're giving this information to because we do have to get our books sold, that's a whole different conversation, and I have a whole different opinion on that. But so let's look at the wrench. What was the first wrench? I forgot. Um, the, the network of people on social network media. So, so in terms of the network of people, yeah, I mean, that, that's, I guess that's, exactly what I was just saying. I mean, the privacy the, the, the privacy that you're not getting from the from the company, unfortunately, does change that. Um, I, I don't I still don't know that I that I think we we could limit the investigation of someone uh, on their on their or that we should. I mean I if if you're concerned about what this person might see, don't friend them. I mean if your friend friends them and they still see it, well if you don't put the fact that you were doing something illegal online. I mean, the, the, I, I guess that's my, my only Can you guys still there. not hear? Am I, am I turning away? I'll just, I'll just sit right here. Yeah. How about that? There you go. Oh, that sounds really good. Yeah. Okay. So it does create a problem that the company, the company itself perpetuates. But while there needs to be legal limits on law enforcement investigations and 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 there and there are but i think we can discuss what they ought to be in this case we also have to allow for investigation and i really still even though the reach is broader it's kind of the same as the undercover cop being at your house when your friend comes by i mean it 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 broadens out the ability to get that data and it does give access to data that we wouldn't otherwise have but I think it, it, it is a traditional investigative technique, and I don't have a problem with friending you as much as I have a problem with using technology to mine your data. Can I, can I jump in really quick? Is it okay. Um, I think for me, one of the problems I have with kind of the analogies to, you know, in real life techniques, um, what I hear is we're talking about the difference between like a horse and a spaceship. Like they'll both get you from point A to point B. We're talking about massively different capacities, massively different velocities. Um, and we make kind of the same um, when you're mentioning kind of the use of algorithms or different data mining, machine learning techniques to learn about someone. I've heard that justifies like, oh, you know, that's just, you know, like, reading about someone in the paper and trying to collate all the information about them. It's not the same. It's horse and spaceship. And with this I hear, you know, it's the same as the undercover cop stopping by your house when all 900 of all the people you've ever met there. are there. there. And we're not sure exactly how you know them, but we're going to make assumptions about how you do. To me, like the analogies they do, they tend to lose a lot of force just because we're talking about massively different things that indeed get you from point A to point B, but in such radically different ways, I think they're part of different conversations. 
And then as far as the second wrench that you just mentioned, the uh, the, the and I lost again. What was the second wrench? <laughs> um, the context. The question yeah. of context. Context, right. So as far as the question of context, I think that is, is a critical distinction. Um, but we, we, we deal with things in the law all the time that are taken out of context. And the ability to put the context back in is part of the defense that you come to. Now, it stinks that you're on the defensive to, to do that. Um, but, but unfortunately, if, if you get in a situation where something has, has been taken out of context and has brought up this issue, you certainly have the ability to use the context to defend yourself. When, when Randall shows up on Facebook with a picture of something that looks very suspiciously like my car, and I then and I then say you stole my car. He certainly has the right to produce a receipt that says I bought this car from this car dealer yesterday. Uh, it, it, you can always put the context in to bring it into the defense. The downside to that is, and this is something I'm always telling my clients. The downside to everything is it's a defense to something that's already happening, not a way to avoid it from happening in the first place. So, well, I, I want to follow that up precisely because I'm thinking. When you say context, one of the issues is that I became, I became a felon based on overbroad and vague laws, and arguably so, although the Supreme Court or the uh, Intermediate Court of Oregon didn't agree. But when something is made illegal in such a way that it's so broad that it could cover a lot of things, and then I share about it online. I don't always know that I'm putting myself in harm's way at that point. And so one of the issues with this sort of oversharing is, in fact, you're giving them ammunition to come take you down. And that's scary. It's very scary. Um, uh, and then to speak to your other point about uh, I, I am on social media because I have a brand. I have to be out there all the time. I have a podcast. I have books. I have trainings I want to sell, that sort of thing. So I do have to be very visible. And so it's part of the job for me. And understanding then what is appropriate sharing and what is just over the top sharing is, is sometimes edgy for me. I don't know all the time. And I've been accused of oversharing from time to time, so here I am. Well, but if you, the, the, the problem becomes when you overshare, I would like to buy 10 kilos of cocaine, please. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's not, not and, that. and that's not a wrong example. That that's the kind of thing that does happen. So, I mean, there's 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 oversharing of, of of things that you know might make us look a little silly if the wrong people saw them, and that we might not want our boss to see on Monday morning. And then there's oversharing of the stuff that is actually admitting to. Criminal activity. Well, well, but uh, let's uh, also put in the uh, for criminal investigations. It's not always about ten kilos of campaign because there are often racial d aspects mm. to investigations. There are people who are targeted unfairly um, because they look like somebody a police officer thinks might be guilty of a crime. Um, there are always going to be communities that are unfairly targeted, um, that are discriminatorily targeted. Um, by these programs, and so it's not necessarily always about the person who says, here are my 10 kilos of cocaine that I purchased or sold yesterday. Um, I think some of these programs really do have a, a big impact on certain communities, and they exaggerate law enforcement techniques that already previously in the analog world are having um, a disproportionate impact. Well, with the, with, the, with the programs, I agree wholeheartedly. With the with the actual data mining uh, programs or, the, or, or algorithms, I, I believe that, that that many of those, if not intentionally, then certainly inadvertently skew skew results and and can skew towards you know racial or demographic groups, and and, and that is probably the core reason of why I feel very differently about that use than the direct public or in-person contact or in context of the uh, of of the data the things that the things that we share on facebook because i'm looking at you specifically and i'm already looking at you specifically for whatever i'm looking at you specifically for but when i'm when i'm essentially aggregating data to find minority crimes it becomes a real issue right so and there are a lot of oh sorry well, yeah, and go and ahead, just to follow up one more time there the, the the thing that's interesting is like, for example, I'm from Oregon, we've uh, legalized uh, recreational marijuana, but that's a state thing, not a federal thing. So if I start talking about 
how I'm using marijuana today on Facebook, are the feds going to come after me? And that's something that's also a concern. All right, lots of different perspectives, lots of different topics kind of thrown into the mix. Who has questions? Lots Ooh, of them. Many Yay. questions. Many questions. Awesome. With your voice raising at the end. Remember the 45 <laughs> seconds with the voice up. Yeah. Yes. Is this on? Oh, cool. So I'm going to try and drive like two, uh, two examples here. Maybe it'll help bring the point home. Um, so one, people tend to uh, lie on the internet. They... No. Never. They sometimes lie. They over embellish. You know, you're talking with people. So, you know, two people got in an argument and online it turns into, yeah, you know, we beat the crap out of each other. You know, things like that. Um, but on the other side, you know, you see other forms where people are communicating. Um, I think of like Dave Ramsey, for example, where he gives very specific advice. And at the end of his show, there's a little disclaimer that says, this is all entertainment. Don't take any of this as legal advice or as actual things that have happened. You know, please don't sue us, basically. So with those two different sides where people are saying things and trying to say, don't count this, and then others over embellishing, how much can you really take what's on the internet and use it as true? Like, can I use that to generate a per, uh, not a permit, um, warrant. A, a warrant, thank you. Or, you know, can I do anything basically to protect myself from when I'm saying these things online under the guise of entertainment versus actual things that I truly believe? Does that make sense? First off, nothing I've said is legal advice, and you can't use it. I think there's a sign down here, isn't there? <laughs> well, I think the problem is that, that you know, again, if we're looking at, let me just use real-world examples from my world. I don't really deal with law enforcement. Like I said, I'm on the civil side. But let me tell you things that, that we use your social media for and how it might be used against you. One is you're at your aunt's birthday party. My process server, or the marshal, is going to go serve you at your aunt's birthday party because I've been trying to find you and you've been hiding. The other thing that happens and that we look for is you're suing because you said you've been injured. You say you can't walk. You say that your back is 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 damaged. But you know, here's a whole photo a roll of you um, bungee jumping. I'm going to bring that in at your deposition to ask how your back feels. So, so those kinds of things aren't necessarily a, a statement being made as much as it's the evidence of your other statements being wrong. As far as taking fake statements, if you say on the internet, we totally beat the crap out of each other, and the other guy wants to then sue you for assault or take out an assault claim, he's certainly going to use that as evidence. Now, if putting things back in context, you put in context what actually happened, you show the actual email transcripts, or you show that no one actually has any bruises, um, you probably have a, an easy time of convincing people that you were not. But if you have an admission to something that someone wants to use against you, then you're going to have to back out of it. And it's hard to it's hard to even be sarcastic on the internet, right? When you say things and it sounds really, really bad when you just suddenly read it in plain text. So that's one of the that's one of the realities of of joking on the internet. It's it's hard to necessarily sometimes tell people that you're joking, but it is something that we will be able to take your statement at face value until proven otherwise. But a lot of what we're looking for isn't actually your statement. It's your other actions that disprove what you're actually telling me. So just real quick, there are two different levels here. There's the information that can be accessed without any court involvement, any any standard being met. Sorry, guys, I'm really trying. Um, and then there is the meet the standard. You can get access to more information. Um, the front end is this public information um, that could be lies, that could be information, private information gleaned from any of the stuff we've talked about. Um, that then, to get access to other information, to meet the reasonable suspicion standard, the probable cause, whatever they need to get the additional information they're seeking, has to go to the judge. And it has to go, it's not just one piece of information that's being taken, it's a, a lot of it. And the judge has to make a decision based on the totality of the circumstances. Um, they get it wrong sometimes. I think we, there are many, many examples of them getting it wrong, but they are supposed to establish it um, with more than just one piece of something that could be sarcasm or a lie. 
Um, and so that's how they gauge that. Um, and then there's the matter of what they can get access to in order to get more access to other things. And there's always that um, dichotomy. So uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the direct law enforcement, but uh, a lot more things, especially at the federal level, are happening administratively. Things like the recent knowledge that the IRS is data mining to decide who to audit, uh, the fact that your uh, social media can be used even as an American citizen as you try to return into the country. You know, so there's a lot of discussion of protecting us so that we can not get to the warrant stage or we have the chance to put things back in context. But how do we protect ourselves and what standards should we be fighting for to make sure that on the administrative side, when you've already been drugged through everything and you haven't even had the chance to defend yourself in court, what, what can we do in that space? Because that's a growing area, both at the federal and the, stu the state level. Um, so, do you want to... Yeah, Jenny, do you want to okay. add? Do you um, reach for me, it's privacy for the user, transparency from the institution. Um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, if, say, the IRS um, is using very fancy technology to make some decisions, um, that technology almost definitely has a lot of biases coded into it and will, you know, replicate problems that we've seen um, in the past used in a discriminatory fashion. Um, my main ask for that, other than you know, making better technology um, and diversity in the tech industry, um, is transparency. You can see precisely how those decisions are made and you can appeal them if they are wrong. Um, I mean, the same goes for a lot of social media. Um, if we're talking about Facebook, some of you may have seen it. If you haven't, I encourage you to go check it out, the page where Facebook tells you what it thinks you like. Um, Twitter also has this buried in their settings where they tell you what advertising buckets they have put you into. Um, and that's something I applaud, the fact that you can see what the platforms, companies, institutions think about you, um, and if it's wrong um, in a dangerous way, that you have a way to appeal it. Um, to me, that is kind of the number one standard to push for. Um, there's also, so ECBA, the Electronic Communications mm -hmm. Privacy Act right now is, is looking to be updated because it was written before the internet was actually the internet that we know today. Um, and so there's this really weird caveat where mail that's older than a certain period of time that they don't need a warrant to access that email. Um, and they're trying to update it to make that like standard because you used to delete old email. Now who's who deletes email? <laughs> Nobody deletes it. We have so much space. You rarely delete anything that you care about. And so instead of giving less protection to that, maybe you should give more protection to the older messages. What is holding that reform up in Congress is because the SEC wants an exception to be able to get access with less than a warrant um, for certain investigations. And it has held that up in the Senate for many, many years now. Um, it had passed the House, I think unanimously last year, and couldn't get through the Senate. Um, so these agencies are trying to get more access to more information with lower standards. Um, I think there is the additional distinction that I started with between public information and private and public and in, public information on its face and public information that reveals private facts and we are trying to get some pickup on additional standards for that latter category for both regulatory agencies as well as law enforcement question in the back uh, when uh, companies like Facebook and Twitter uh, update their privacy policies it kind of makes it apparent that there is no real interest in the consumer's privacy. It's all just about what they can justify. And that leads me to be really concerned about whether they're even following the rules that they promise they are. And when law enforcement goes to a, a, a major social media company like Facebook or Twitter and asks to see private messages or deleted messages, I'm not sure that, they, that I, any of the parties involved have the common person's interest in mind. And I was wondering if y'all had any opinions on what uh, yeah. a person might do about that. I mean, we, Snowden kind of created a thing yeah. <laughs> where, where companies actually really got hit hard on any compliance they had done without challenging law enforcement data requests. And in the wake of that, um, and Jenny can talk about the work EFF has done on who has your back, and TJ and Randall can weigh in. Um, many, many companies have started issuing what are called transparency reports, 
which are invaluable in our space. And they tell you how many different court orders they've received for information, um, how many times they've complied, to the extent they can reveal that information. National security requests have some limits on what information they can reveal, unfortunately. Um, they are, I think, companies are more aware of than ever that if they comply willingly with law enforcement requests, that that information will be made public. Um, so I think they have received some incentive not to. Um, that's not to say that it doesn't happening in several circumstances, but there is great public pressure on them that they are aware of post Snowden. And these transparency reports have helped and most companies do put them out now. I know the, the what's really a cool thing is the canaries, the ones where they say, as long as this page is up on our website, we have not yet been served something that we can't talk about. That's a really amazing technique. I'm glad people came up with that. Yeah, yeah, libraries came up with that, yeah. says the librarian on the panel. Um, <laughs> yeah, in addition to transparency reports, another really good resource, um, again, says the EFF person on the panel, um, the EFF's Who Has Your Back Report, uh, which is kind of the question I heard you asking. Um, if I'm not mistaken, kind of like who among these parties involved in this transaction, who has my back as the user? Um, that is the question EFF asks every year um, of a list of, I think this year it was 18 companies. Um, and we go through several questions about kind of do they follow industry-wide best practices? Do they have a transparency report? Um, when the government comes knocking with a national security letter, an NSL um, that Amy and Randall are talking about, a gag order, um, do they have a policy of challenging it in court? Um, it goes through every year, you know, five or six key questions that hopefully can give you a better idea of indeed who has your back. Um, and different companies score wildly differently. Um, generally, the large telcos tend to score the lowest. Um, but I, I highly, highly recommend checking that out. There's a lot to learn there. So, yeah. yeah, sorry. So, so far, we've been talking about intentional share of data. And my question is um, more about the unintentional sharing of data. So. What legal protections do we have surrounding geographical data, thinking like ways, you know, tracking my, me deliberately sharing, you know, my geographical location through navigational programs? Well, well, that goes to the idea of what you're making public by not knowing you're making it public. Um, you know, when we talk about what ways is going to track or what Gmail reads out of your mail or what Facebook tracks for to sell you advertising, it's all the stuff that you are making public because you've not opted out of it or if there's not an option to opt out of it not use ways or, or whatever choice you want to make to 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 keep that data private <coughs> and 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 a lot of times in in our society as it exists today in in, in the technology that exists we choose convenience over privacy we like the we like to use the fun new toys and we don't think about the fact that that data is then being generated and can be can be searched, can be public. Did we make it private? Does the EULA or the terms of service say that it's going to be private? And I don't know the answer for Waze. I don't actually use Waze. But I mean, I, if I did, honestly, I wouldn't know it either because I don't look at it either. I'm a lawyer and I still don't check Has the Has anybody in here things. ever read a EULA, a user? <laughs> Wow. But only yes. ones I've written. I never read the ones. <laughs> That's shocking. I'm just curious. Yeah. That's the most hands I've ever seen. Yeah, in a good, good on you. Um, real quick, just because I'm really glad that answer was open, because there's an answer to this that's just basically watch this space. Um, this show might be really exciting for privacy. Um, and I'm glad that you pinged that part of my brain to bring this up. Um, back in 2012, there was a case called US v. Jones, um, where law enforcement put a GPS device onto a car. And the question was, and for 30 days track location of that car. And the question was, was law enforcement able to do that without a warrant? Because they didn't have a valid warrant when they did it. And they argued really hard that they could because it's location. And technically they could follow that car around and get its location for that period of time. And the Supreme Court unanimously said no. Um, but they pinned their decision back in 2012 on the attachment of the GPS device to the car. And said that was a seizure under the Fourth Amendment and they needed a warrant to do it. But there is this shadow majority. This is like the world I live in where we get to talk about shadow majorities of the Supreme Court. It's really kind of cool. Um, that expressed that they would be willing to find a privacy invasion even without that physical trespass based on the amount of time that they tracked the location data um, and that they were tracking it over a period of time um, under what is called mosaic theory. 
Um, they basically, it's the idea that, you know, if you have one location information, you have one little tab tile, and another one is another little tile. And once you get enough of those little tiles, you paint a mosaic, and you actually get all of this information. Um, and so there's another case going through the Supreme Court this year that doesn't have that um, physical violation. Um, and so there's the idea that this shadow majority of the Supreme Court will become the actual majority of the Supreme Court. And they will say that you cannot track data over that long um, without some sort of process, probably a warrant. Um, we will then have to figure out what that line is. But that goes to the fact that there um, are law enforcement officers now going to cell phone towers and getting what we call cell phone tower dumps which is just taking a bunch of information out of the cell towers um, and going through it under the guise that it's public location information. Um, it will really like create new rules and new laws in the space of what they can get without process. Um, and I think that's a really exciting thing happening this year. And so as I started with like, watch this space. Okay, this thing on? Okay. <laughs> Uh, regarding a, there was a recent case, I believe, uh, LinkedIn. I think they lost it, where um, where uh, another company was skimming data, user data off their site, and they I believe they lost the case because it was publicly available. The per they weren't the company didn't have wasn't at the point where they had to actually create an account and agree to a, a EULA that precluded data mining and scraping. Uh, when it's a law enforcement agency involved, if like in the case of a law enforcement uh, officer who created an account and that agreed to that EULA, is, how much of a factor is that in getting such data when it's in a violation of a EULA that was agreed to on that account? Is that a factor for law enforcement at all in cases? Does it weaken the case at all? I, I'm not 100% sure I understand. So let me, let me make sure I understand the question. Is, is the question is the question that if if I am a law enforcement agent and I log into a site with a real or fake account to mm -hmm. become your friend, look at your information, do whatever it is I'm trying to investigate, am I bound by the EULA? Well, the officer, the, the person who create, yeah, is that, are they bound at all if the account was created for that purpose to access additional information that was not available publicly, is that a factor at all in court? Well, you're still, I mean, you're still creating an account. You're still, you're still accepting that contract. It, it, the question, the question I think is. Does it, does it weaken the case at all if they bring a case against somebody that they acquired data through those means? Well, what are they, 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 uh, the, the question I think becomes what are they, what are they, what are they, what are they getting? If I look at your LinkedIn profile and I get your job history or something like that just on the page, I'm not violating the EULA by getting that information if I if the if the EULA says I can't use data mi data mining software and mm -hmm. I do mm -hmm. then you have a problem that's kind but of I'm probably I using data mining software without logging in to the fake pro the, the 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 logging in to look at you because we've joined up on LinkedIn or become friends on Facebook that's that's me investigating you specifically and and that's got the you know the okay. entrapment and horse and spaceship question but the the, the whole data mining thing isn't isn't through me joining I mean, fake profiles. But if the data mining was done while the account, with that additional ac access, additional information that isn't publicly available, isn't that an issue? So the the I, number one Fourth Amendment remedy for information that was collected that shouldn't have been collected was collected in violation of the Fourth Amendment um, is the exclusionary rule, meaning it will be excluded from trial. If they get information um, and don't use it at court, there's really um, limited remedy, okay. um, unfortunately. Um, so I think that is one of the big things. Um, the better example, Facebook has a real name policy. So anybody who creates a Facebook profile without their real name is in violation of their terms of service, um, arguably. And so there could be a problem there. But if they never actually, if they only are using that information to figure things out and to track down investigative leads that they can follow up with later, other things, sorry, I keep getting further away, follow up other things later, then they never take it to court and that never gets challenged. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll add, um, I'll add one more thing really quickly. I think an example of what you're talking about, and I believe this was researchers, not law enforcement. So if someone knows this better than me, please correct me. Um, I think about two years ago it was OkCupid. Um, some researchers just like scraped the hell out of it 
and use some lovely data mining techniques to learn things about it. And it was a big question of like, whoa, is this ethical? Like, sure, it's publicly available because it's okay, Cupid. Like, you want to date. Um, so if you have not publicly available, available to people with a login, right? You have an account who have logged in. Um, OkCupid's terms of service say, hey, don't scrape the site, don't mine the site. Uh, but now this data set is out in the world of arguably sensitive information that people didn't want necessarily to get out beyond kind of the enclosed environment that is OkCupid users. Um, so I think that's an open question for law enforcement, for researchers, kind of for any actor who wants to use these kind of methods within the enclosures of a private website. This, this wasn't a legal case. This was just like researchers making a data set and putting it online and all of us being like, what have you done? Yeah. Question? Next. Uh, so tech companies don't want to reveal a lot of information about their users, which can be good. But in the case of somebody pretending to be you and admitting to crimes under the guise that they are you, uh, how would one go about protecting themselves? Could you get a subpoena for the IP address if it was, say, 4chan where it's totally anonymous? how would one go about protecting themselves when somebody's imitating them online? Well, if someone's pretending to be you online, that's, that's identity theft, and it's a, I mean, there are lots of different avenues to pursue an identity theft uh, issue. There's also, uh, well, I mean, you probably have a lot of consumer corrected and corrective type of, uh, you oh, know, information. Sure. Yeah. But, but, I mean, the, the, the first and foremost step is you would report it as identity theft or identity crime, and and you let the law enforcement handle it in your favor that way. But then, I mean, they would have to get the IP address. They'd have to get some kind of information if the website doesn't want to release that because they're trying to protect their users. Then, I mean, what would you do in that case? Uh, I've never seen a yeah. law. They will challenge things that need challenged. Um, in certain cases, they will give over information that needs to be given mm -hmm. over as well. Um, I think the number one problem is going to be if that person was operating under under something like a Tor node, um, mm -hmm. which does become a problem, unfortunately, um, that people commit crimes under Tor nodes. They also do really good things that should be done under Tor nodes. Um, yeah. that it is a problem. Um, but most of the time, the companies, when these are legitimate requests, will turn over the information that needs to be turned over to pursue criminal activity. Okay, thank you. Um, if we can get two questions at once, and then we have to wrap up because we're running out of time, guys. I'm really sorry. Not, not a problem. We'll take two at a time. We'll take two, whatever the last two are. Everybody will go down the row and respond to them and give wrap-up comments, and then we're available after the panel. Um, I do practice criminal law and um, feel like the sting operations are really useful for law enforcement. So I was wondering what you guys um, see as the differences between in-person sting operations and online sting operations, considering um, so much happens online now through Facebook or more especially like Backpage and some of those kinds of websites. And is there one more? <sighs> okay, if you guys can ask questions in 20 seconds or less. Challenge preferred. That's the word I'm looking for. I'm a privacy researcher at Georgia Tech, and I just was wondering if you could comment briefly on, um, you're talking a lot about companies that are largely digital entities, and if you could talk about the retail world that is using data mining technologies while you're physically walking the store with data that you leak. Okay. How useful do you guys think a VPN is in protecting your information? I have one myself. My big question is, after the information's out there, is there anything you can do to fix it? Was there one more? One more. Yes, com community policing, broken windows, stop and frisk, has become highly controversial. So I think we'll see a strong shift toward uh, surveillance techniques like uh, electronic surveillance. Do, do you see that shift rehearsing basically the same dynamics of bias, or do yeah. you see advantages okay. going that way? So down the panel, um, virtual sting ops, physical stores, VPN, and the dynamics of moving online. Go. Okay. I'll address the middle two that I think I'm best poised to address. I'll defer to my fellow panelists. Um, retail stores, uh, you said you know, they're tracking you physically, doing creepy stuff. I put them in the exact same group as social media. Um, I think that the 
the phenomenon we're seeing is that increasingly more and more physical spaces are being co-opted into surveillance spaces that weren't before. Um, that adjustment is happening rapidly. Um, and I say adjustment kind of with a mixed heart. I don't think we should adjust. This, this is not normal. It should never be normal. So I see them, all the things I was talking about, about transparency, about respecting your privacy, I feel the exact same way about that. It's just an increasingly new frontier of surveillance and defending against it. Um, second about VPNs, VPNs are great. Um, they can be a great way to you know, tunnel through an insecure network that you're concerned about. Um, it's hard to recommend a VPN to trust. They're changing constantly. Um, we were talking about at a previous panel, TunnelBear is nice. I'm a fan of TunnelBear. Um, they recently had an audit, which is a good thing. Um, and then I you said, sir. Huh? Thank you. Yep. Oh, sorry. Whoa. Yeah, so TunnelBear recently had an audit. That was great. Um, they're one place to start, but there's a whole constellation of VPNs to choose from. Um, and just ask for a quick clarification, you said once the information is out there, you mean like if something is public and you wish it weren't? You Google yourself and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect this to be here. Um, it really depends on what the thing is and where it is out there. Um, you know, if, you, if there's something on a people finder site that you don't want there, um, you can go through an opt out process. Every people finder site has a different labyrinth you need to go through, but they're required to give you an opt out. Um, if it is, you know, a photo um, on a social media website, um, then you can maybe go through your own settings and make adjustments or take things down. Um, I think the scary thing is if something is out there and has been picked up by someone else or has been picked up by something you have no control over, which is often, you know, that's the kind of scary bedtime story we tell people. Like, once you put it on the internet, it's out there forever. Um, I think that it's good to focus on the things you have control over and to the extent that you can minimize information that you have control over, then you're in a much better position when information you don't have control over gets out. All right, TJ Next. and Randall, we're in our last I'll, I'll take three and a half minutes. I'll take I'll take two the minutes. other two then. So and I can be very very brief because I think we've already actually touched on these topics. Um, the sting the sting issues. Uh, again, I I do see it to be akin to a real world sting, but horse and spaceship. I mean, there's a there there's there's a there's certainly a much broader reach. And I think it is something that we ought to consider, at least think about, whether we change or limit that because of the the benefit to an investigation of that of of, of that type of, of operation. I don't know. But the difference I think is exactly what was said earlier. It's a difference of scope. The 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 activity is exactly the same, but I might be able to find a whole lot more out about you and your friends than I would if I came and sat on your sofa one night. So that's that that's the only real tangible difference I think that I, that I can think of as we sit here today. As far as the 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 question about biases, I, I think that's the real risk. Um, if we talk about the first use I mentioned, that sort of one-to-one -one investigation, me investigating you, the officer doing that investigation is going to carry over the same biases he'd have as a stop and frisk on the street. If he has biases, they're going to be in his investigation online, just like they'd be in his investigation on the sidewalk. More critically, those biases multiply when you get into data mining aggregators because you're not, you know, the monitoring programs pick up all the biases that we put into Ten them seconds. and then it, it, it grows uh, exponentially as it's, as it's mining that data. So it's a real issue. And just briefly, on the VPN issue, if you're paranoid enough that you want to use a VPN, you should be using Tor instead. VPNs are only going to encrypt it from your laptop to the wide worldwide internet, but it's not going to encrypt it all the way down. You need to use Tor instead. Thank you, everybody. If you have other questions, feel free to come up to the panel. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time at the conference. Thank you to all of these great people on stage.